What if I told you, you could build me mic very similar to this one, capable of well over 70 miles an hour for under $2,000. Welcome to eBike Theory. My name's Riley, and I'll be guiding you through the build process, as well as explaining the theory behind all the most important components. Of course, there's a parts list below if you'd like to follow along, and also, the bike we build in this video will be available via giveaway. Let's get started. An electric bicycle is basically a collection of parts and components connected onto one central frame, like this one here. Now, on this frame, we have common components, like your seat, your brakes, your wheels, stuff you'd recognize from normal bicycles, but also some new electronic components, such as a big brushless motor, a motor speed controller, a battery, a DC-DC converter. And don't worry, if you don't know what any of that means, we'll go over it soon. Let's start with the battery. Almost all e-bikes use lithium batteries. They're very high energy density, they can produce a lot of power, but they're dangerous if they're treated wrong. There's lots of different shapes and sizes of lithium batteries, but most of them are empty at around three volts and fully charged at 4.2 volts. If you drain the battery below three, it's dangerous to try to bring it back up to voltage. If you charge your battery to above 4.2 volts per cell, it can be quite dangerous and the battery can catch fire. Within the normal operating range from three volts to 4.2 volts, they're quite safe and used routinely on e-bikes and then things like your phones, cameras, laptops, pretty much anything with a battery nowadays has a lithium battery in it. For e-bikes, lithium ion batteries are usually the best fit. This is because of their combination of a pretty good energy density as well as a pretty good discharge ratio. Sure, you could get more discharge out of a pack like a LiPo battery with a smaller size, but it's easier for things to go wrong with lithium polymer. Now, if you'll recall, I said that a typical lithium cell has an empty voltage of around three volts and a full voltage of around 4.2 volts. Let's say you connect 20 of them in series. Now you've got an empty voltage of around 60 volts and a full voltage of around 84 volts. That's a lot better for an e-bike. By connecting 20 of these cells in series, we get a 20S battery like this one here. These batteries used to ship with the Onyx RCR. Unfortunately, Onyx isn't making bikes right now, but you can get your hands on one of these batteries for around 200, 300, sometimes 400 bucks. That's a really good deal for a 20S lithium ion pack. Inside of this case here, you'll find 20 groups of eight cells. Each cell group has a ton of batteries in parallel so that you can build up the capacity. And then all of those parallel groups are connected in series to build up the voltage. Connecting to every single parallel group in this battery is one main circuit board called a BMS. This battery management system is something that's hidden within the case here. It makes sure every group of cells has the same voltage, cuts off discharge or charge to the pack in the event that there's a problem with one of the cell groups and also prevents us from over discharging or pulling too much power from the battery battery back if it doesn't have that much power to give. This Onyx RCR battery has a 100 amp BMS. That means that we can pull 100 amps from this battery pack at its 84 volt voltage before the BMS will cut us off and say, hey, that's too much. That's 8.4 kilowatts of power. This battery has two ports, a charge port and a discharge port. That's because the BMS can independently shut off charge or discharge the battery. If you try to charge it with too much voltage or too much current, the BMS might shut off your charge. If you try to discharge it with too much power, like well over 100 amps, the BMS might shut off your discharge. At the end of the day, the BMS is what keeps your battery safe. All right, so that's your battery. Next, let's talk about the motor. A brushless motor, commonly used in drones or e-boards or brushless gimbals, works on a few very simple principles. A brushless motor has three wires going into it. These wires deliver power to electrical windings, which are arranged in a circle pattern around the outside of the motor. This is called the stator, or stationary part of the motor. Whenever one of these windings are energized, it creates a magnetic field, like an electromagnet. At any given moment, two of these three wires conduct current to create an electromagnetic field within a set of windings, while the third remains inactive. By changing which two wires have current, we can change which set of windings produce a magnetic field. By changing this quickly, we can create a magnetic field that basically moves in a circle throughout the motor. There's something called a rotor made of permanent magnets patterned around the outside of the motor. The rotating magnetic field generated by these windings pulls the rotor in a circle causing the motor to spin. There's lots of different types of brushless motors, but for this project, we're gonna be using a brushless hub motor. We'll be using this NB205 hub but how do we control the motor? Well, a brushless motor requires its own speed controller. Coming from the drone world, I'm very familiar with the term ESC, or electronic speed controller. An e-bike controller is very similar to the ESCs you'll find in your drones with a few key differences. For example, these controllers usually have their own settings and software built into them. The one we're using here today has a USB that you can plug into via Bluetooth or computer and change all your custom motor parameters. Also, these e-bike controllers directly interface with your other components, like your throttle for controlling the speed, like switches or levers for cutting power to the motor while braking. And also, these speed controllers use something called Hall sensor 
filters, which we'll get to shortly. For our build, I've selected the Sabaton controller for ease of wiring, installation, and cost. It pulls 100 amps, which is exactly what our battery can supply. On the top here, it has a positive and negative for our battery, and three colorful connections for our motor phase wires. Let's go over the connectors quickly and what they do. This is our hall sensor connector. I know I said that a brushless motor only needs three wires to work, and while that is technically true, if you want to spin it up from a start really smoothly, and you want to know exactly how fast it's going, you're going to need a sensor within the motor. The sensors we have in an e-bike are Hall Effect sensors, and typically in a motor, you'll find three. The way a Hall Effect sensor works is it has three wires. The negative goes to your battery minus, the positive gets five volts from the speed controller, and the output outputs somewhere between zero and five volts, based on how much of a magnetic field the sensor is exposed to. By placing three of these sensors within your motor and spacing them evenly, as your motor spins, your speed controller knows exactly how fast your motor is going. Your speed controller can use the information from these Hall sensors sensors to bring your motor to a smooth start from a full stop, and these hall sensors can plug directly into your display to tell you how fast you're going. Now to accommodate these sensors, this connector has 5 volts that goes to all the sensors, ground that goes to all the sensors, and then 3 wires for each sensor output. But wait, there's one more wire. Now that's your temperature sensor. It's there in case your motor gets way too hot, your speed controller can cut off power to prevent any damage. You really don't want to burn up a brushless motor while it's moving because it'll lock up. That being said, it's really hard to burn them up if you're running them within your rated power range. I'm usually not running my motors within that range, so I love the temp sensor. Next is your three-pin connector here for your throttle. Again, ground, five volts, and signal return. Your throttle is basically a hall sensor, and depending on how much you turn the throttle, it'll send a voltage somewhere between zero and five with zero being a full stop and five being open throttle. Up next, let's talk about the three speed wire. This speed controller lets us set three different speed settings so we can have an eco, a normal, and a sport mode for our bike. By connecting the center wire to the wire labeled low, we'll be in eco mode. If we connect it to high, we'll be in sport mode. And if we leave it in touch, we'll be in normal mode. Next, let's talk about the one labeled e-brake throttle. This is another throttle, but not for speeding up. It's actually for slowing down. One of the best parts of brushless motors is regenerative braking. You can use that motor to slow you down and also bring some that power back to the battery. There's a few different ways we can use this. My favorite is to put a little thumb throttle on your left handlebar, and you can use that thumb throttle to cut power to the motor and slow you down depending on how much you push it. It's not something you need to use, but I'll be showing you how to wire it up in this video. That's not the only brake connector on the speed controller. There's this one too. One wire is labeled brake zero volt and one wire is labeled reverse. By connecting brake zero volts to ground, the speed controller will enter a braking mode. We can configure whether this braking mode just cuts off power to the motor or whether it starts regenerating and braking as well. The idea is this cable usually gets attached to a brake lever so that if you squeeze the levers on your brakes, it'll naturally cut off power to the motor as well as enter region if you choose. This speed controller also has a brake high. This wire does the same exact thing as brake low, but to activate it, it needs to receive 12 volts instead of being connected to ground or negative. And we're not gonna wire up the reverse wire because it's an e-bike, let's be real. Now this green wire here called hall meter is just a duplicate of one of the hall sensor wires. The reason it goes through the speed control to make our wiring neater. This will connect to our display and tell the display how fast the bike is going. Every time our motor spins, the hall sensor will output a bunch of pulses to the speed controller and the speed controller will pass those through that wire to the display and the display can then calculate how fast we're going based on how many pulses it's getting. The last wire to talk about here is this orange E-Lock 72 volt switch. Since the battery is really high power, you don't wanna be disconnecting the main positive and negative all the time to turn the thing on and off. The way we bypass this is having the controller connected to the battery the whole time, but the controller only enables itself when this orange wire is connected to the battery positive. So that'll go through a switch we have, typically on the handlebars or with a key on the side of the bike. The next electronic component I'll talk about is the DC-DC. The DC-DC converts DC power or to DC power. In this case, it'll be converting the battery voltage from around 60 to 80 volts down to a stable 12 volts. Now that 12 volts will run our display as well as our turn signals and lights and anything else you wanna connect up to the bike. This DC-DC has a connector with five wires going into it. The thick red wire with the fuse is our input. That goes to our battery positive and stays connected the whole time, just like the speed controller. The thin black wire goes directly to our battery as well this time to the negative terminal. The yellow wire is our 12 volts out and the black wire is our 12 volts ground. In a system like this, we don't really need to have separate grounds, so we'll probably connect them when we get to the wiring stage. Now there's one more wire on here, a thin red one, and that's our key switch. That will be connected to the output of the same key switch we use to turn on the speed controller. That way, when the speed controller is signaled to turn on, 
This guy also turns on and starts outputting 12 volts. The next complicated electronic component to talk about is our display. This display has a ton of wires going into it. Basically, all of those wires are different inputs for things that this can display. It'll connect to that hall wire to output our speed. It connects to our DC-DC to get 12 volts. It connects to our battery voltage as well, so it can read the battery voltage out. And it's got tons of indicator lights down here to tell you whether you're turning left or right, whether your headlight's on or your high beam's on, and whether you're in eco mode, sport mode, or normal mode. Now, of course, this bike has other components. We're gonna be putting a headlight on it. We'll get some turn signals on it as well. We also never really talked about our forks, our brakes, our brake rotors, our front wheel our seat, our crank arms, our pedals, and all that fun stuff. But I don't think those components need their own sections, and we'll be able to explain how they fit in while we get to that part in the build. Now with all that theory out of the way, let's start building. 